Hello, this is Dr. Kornman, and we're going to talk about the surgical indications and treatment of cervical and lumbar herniated discs. The anatomy of the disc is relatively simple. Some people call it a jelly-filled donut, where the interior, the jelly, the nucleus, is under pressure, and the outer part of the disc, the annulus that you can see here, are about 60 rings of collagen, very similar to plies on a tire. The nucleus itself is hydrophilic. It loves water and acts as a giant sponge to remain under pressure. The outer annulus holds the nucleus in. You can see its relationship to the nerve roots in back here, where the two nerve roots and the central canal are right in back of the disc. The disc itself has a very good blood supply, but literally disappears by the age of eight. There are more torsional forces than any other structure in the body, and injury to the disc here is cumulative. The disc's age. Obviously, without a blood supply, the disc itself loses its ability to have the cells continue to work at their normal rate, and they become senescent. These cells are important to make this structure work. This is a hyaluronic acid backbone with a link protein and a proteoglycan monomer. These are hydrophilic. This is what holds the water in. And over time, since the cells inside the disc become senescent, these areas break down. And as they break down, there's less ability to hold water, and the pressure drops in the disc. As the pressure drops, there's more stress placed on the outer wall, and the outer wall starts to develop tears. What happens are initially annular tears. You can see a wonderful picture of an MRI of an annular tear here, where the disc has lost its ability to hold water, so it's black inside. And you can see this inflammatory tear with a very small herniation here. This tear is the starting of the degenerative cascade. It can lead to a disc herniation. It can lead to instability of the entire motor complex. It could lead to loss of shock absorption, and it could lead to bone spur formation. The degenerative cascade starts with a tear in the disc, and then the jelly itself loses its ability to hold water. The nucleus becomes less able to hold hydration. And on an MRI, you can see a normal disc here, where there's plenty of white water within the disc space. You start to lose it here, a little more degenerative here, and you can see this disc here is essentially given up the ghost. It's no longer acting as a shock absorber, and you can see the bony changes around the outside of the vertebra that surround the disc. These are stress fractures of the bone, and this is what causes that deep, dull ache within the back in patients who do vibration or impact activities. Patient wiring is important as some patients with this condition have no back pain and others have significant disabling back pain. A lumbar herniation is essentially a tear through the back wall where the nucleus squirts out the back, so to speak, and fills up a portion of the canal. This, of course, compresses the nerve root, and this will create nerve root signs. Now, the hallmark symptoms are leg and buttocks pain. Some people will be diagnosed with a, something called a piriformis syndrome, but this is a very rare event and almost doesn't occur. The typical signs in a patient will be sensory changes, reflex deficits, possibly motor deficits, and certainly tension signs. When you pull on the nerve, the nerve will hurt. These patients tend to like to stand and do not like to bend forward. They don't like to sit down as flexion or sitting will cause increased tension on the nerve. There's a very small subset of patients with a herniation that do get worse with extension. Surgical indications are straightforward. If a patient has a motor deficit in a major motor group that will impair their gait, they certainly need surgery. This would include something called foot drop or a problem with their gastroxoleus group where they can't push up the stairs or push off, or if their quad becomes weak. 
Patients with massive herniations can develop a cauda equina syndrome. This is where the back of the canal is fully compressed and the entire cauda equina passing through starts to malfunction. Patients with this can have saddle anesthesia, can have significant bilateral buttocks and leg pain, and can develop problems with bowel and bladder. The third indication for a microdiscectomy is significant pain. If patients have gone through a conservative care program, do not have cauda equina syndrome or motor deficit, and do not get better with injections, with physical therapy, and with medications, these patients are candidates for microdiscectomies. The microdiscectomy is a simple procedure. A small incision was made in the midline. This muscle, the multifidi, is detached from the center and gently pulled to the side. And then a little laminotomy is made here. It already shows the curette into the disc space and the rongeur, but the nerve is decompressed first by removing the fragment, and then any loose material within the disc space is removed. Microdiscectomy results are pretty good. It's about a 90 to 95% success rate for relief of pain. That 5% of patients who do not get leg pain relief may have nerve injuries called chronic radiculopathy, and that may not be able to be treated with a surgery. There is a 10 to 15% chance of having a recurrent herniation. As we've discussed before, there is no good blood supply to the disc, and therefore tears in the disc don't heal. A herniated disc means that there's been a through and through tear to the disc and there's another chance of a recurrent herniation with or without surgery. Microdiscectomy patients can return to low mid-level function in 10 days and to high level function in 6 weeks. Competition can be in 8 to 12 weeks and rehabilitation is essential for this. For the cervical herniation, this will obviously create neck, arm, and scapular pain. It's important to note that most patients that have a herniated disc will have referral pain that ends up between the shoulder blades. Patients with a herniation will develop motor, sensory, reflex, and possibly even cord signs. These patients are better with neck flexion. They like to have their head down. Also, some patients with a large herniation, as you see in this image right here, these patients will have pain unless they put their arm up over their head in an external rotation abduction maneuver, which is called Bacotti's sign. Surgical indications for a cervical herniation are, again, motor deficit, cord signs such as myelopathy, and pain. An ACDF is the standard treatment to take care of a large disc herniation that is in the lateral aspect. The ACDF is an anterior cervical decompression infusion, and the success rate is probably just about as high as in the lumbar spine. An ACDF, you note you remove whatever's left of the disc, you reach behind, remove any of the herniated fragments or spurs, and then put a small bone graft in between the vertebra, and this creates the fusion. Postoperatively, this is what an x-ray looks like, where you have a solid fusion between the vertebra and a plate which was put there to allow the patient to rehab faster and earlier. ACDF results are very similar in many respects to the microdiscectomy. There's a 90 to 95% success rate for relief of arm pain. There is a rate of pseudoarthrosis of lack of fusion, which is not high, but it's higher with a cadaver specimen than with autograft. The fusion in with autograft normally consolidates by six weeks. Patients can be back to low energy activities in 10 days, mid-level activities in six weeks, and competition in eight to 12 weeks. And again, rehabilitation is essential. The future leads to discal regeneration, Possible artificial discs, I think there is a place for them in the neck, probably not in the lumbar spine, and even percutaneous treatment. Thank you for your attention.